Hi, everyone. The Art for Everyone podcast is back, even though we're going to uh, do it a little bit less. We're still going to be doing it. So it's going to be every other week, uh, maybe uh, more than once a month, maybe twice. We'll see how it kind of plays out. But you know how this goes. You got one guy that's going through a journey of learning about art. Another person that's been battling that journey for his life. And then we bring on a third person that he kind of knows and we kind of work through some some art stuff. Right, Michael? Well, when you first described that, I thought I was the first guy because I feel like I'm learning every day. I'm trying to figure this stuff out myself. But thank you. No, you're battling it, man. I was going to say you're in it, but no, you're battling, bro. It is a battle. Uh, it, it is every day a mental and physical battle. We but all are. <laughs> yeah, for real. But thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We did take a little bit of a break. We are back. We are kind of feeling things out much like uh, – the art business is but i want to give a shout out real quick to our spot i want to thank Vinny with the enriquez group for all of your southern california real estate needs carini arts check out my stuff i got some cool merch i got stickers stuff like that and they do make a difference even the little stuff makes a big difference for small businesses and then i want to give a shout out to sparks gallery who i recently did a live feed with on instagram they're going to be a future guest but sonia sparks of sparks gallery is now doing artist consultations where you can message her and she'll set up a consultation where she customizes a program and helps you if you are interested in approaching galleries. So let her know that we sent you. And today we have Justin. Justin, how do we pronounce your last name? Just because I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> uh, Vasey. Okay. Justin Vasey. And Justin, we usually let the guests introduce themselves because we don't want to tell anybody who they are. So tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and who you are. Sure. So I'm a full-time artist. Um, I've been doing arts professionally since 2012. Um, full-time. Uh, I decided to go full-time artist the week before the world shut down. <laughs> and then, um, you know, uh, we home, I have a family and we homeschool our son during the day. So I do my art during the morning or at night. Um, and just every day, constantly trying to do the art life, which is a little bit of art. And then all the marketing, all the business, all the... <laughs> yeah, there's. I've been saying that, that a lot of people have this impression that when you're a full-time artist, they think that you just make art all day and that is seldom or at least in my experience seldom the case there's sometimes days even weeks like i'm in one of those weeks right now where i'm not doing any studio work right now i'm doing a lot of marketing promotion i reached out to like over a hundred companies in the past three days there's a lot more to making this sustainable than just making the artwork don't you think oh yeah and you know reaching out and coming up with with personal letters or messages or anything it it is so time consuming to even reach out to just a couple um you know and you have to have some pretty thick skin because for for every hundred you put out one person might respond and it doesn't even mean it's a good response yep that is so, very much the truth but, but that's what i tell people that you have to learn to kind of callous yourself and that no is not a bad thing that it's just one door closes and it allows you to kind of move in the direction of what's going to be open to you yeah, and you know that door might open later. So yes. just never burn bridges. You never know. Like something might change in the you know the way they do business, and all of a sudden you you become appealing to them, or you know then you have a little bit of leverage and like oh yeah we spoke before. <laughs> and Vinny, I have to think it's the same for real estate too, isn't it? Like you probably deal with a lot of no's before you you get to the yes. No, every person I talk to says yes to me. <laughs> Teach us. <laughs> Teach no, me, no, there's, there's there's a uh, an idea that you have to at least in, in real estate, a hundred uh, ninety nine no's to get to one yes. That's basically kind of like the the golden rule kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's but yeah, I know. I mean, rejection. I mean, I actually the funny thing is I was talking to my team this morning. We have a team meeting every morning, and I I have to remind them every every so often that the no, the rejection is hard. It's even harder when you don't take anything away from it. 
right? I mean, like, because sometimes you just want to like turn your back on that no and go on to the next thing, but you're like, what could I have done differently to get a yes that time? Is there something I could have done differently? Definitely, oh, yeah. yeah. That's interesting because I, I think that there's probably some truth to that and that might be a good thing in art. But I've also had to kind of learn that not every relationship is a good relationship relationship for you. So sometimes in, in art, at least, or at least for my experience, sometimes getting that no means, okay, you know, that's not the right place for me. So sometimes it may be something that I can do, but sometimes it's just an indication that, oh, okay, you know, maybe that wasn't the thing. And sometimes the worst thing that can happen for you is to get what you asked for. So we're um... – People can get broken down into, in essence, four categories. I'm going to butcher these four categories, but one's basically like direct, right? One's more analytical. One's more uh, emotional. And I forgot the, the fourth one, right? But we have four different ones, right? So if if you're in a, dr a direct personality, right, and you're trying to get a yes from and someone else is direct, you're going to have a higher likelihood, right, compared to maybe someone that's a more emotional base and if you're really direct. But if you can be a chameleon of your emotions and your types, right, you're going to have a higher chance of getting a yes from those other three sets of people. So yes, your artwork's going to change, right? But how you how you present it, I mean, your artwork's not going to change, but how you present it can change. Yeah. yeah, there's some truth there. And I would say that I'm both direct and emotional. So insane, you know, I think that's a that's a typical artist artist way and you know as you said uh you know we can change how we present our art our art always changes and sometimes it doesn't change with your followers you know um you'll maybe get some new ones but maybe lose some old ones it's always it's always interesting to me especially this past six months i've been extremely experimental i think and I don't know how people are going to respond to it. And I have to learn to realize that I can't control that. I just, I got to present it and, you know, I'm going to create what I want to create. And then that's where we go. <laughs> how, hey, just how would you present or describe your art to a blind person? Extremely colorful, abstract, uh, with heavy texture, and I would encourage them to touch my paintings. I am not a person living in fear of hand oils and all that. Uh, everything has an expiration date, and if if that person was blind and I let them touch my paintings and it made their day, it's worth it. It's interesting you say that because I have a couple pieces that I've done that are process pieces. I call them part of my beautiful accidents collection, and it's essentially like my table canvas, and it's me wiping my palette knife for years and years and then after having it for five years ten years i will frame it and i'll bring it i brought it a couple of times to when i do festivals and i encourage people to touch it and i think that people love doing that because one a lot of them are undrawn but two mm -hmm. uh, generally you're not supposed to touch the art but i think that people like being able to touch something they're not supposed to be able to touch and people are so tactile but i very much think of it as like braille like it's the road map of my history and it just adds to the sensory experience that people already have with art. So I think that that's beautiful, uh, people being able to, to touch the work. And you said something else, too, that really caught my attention in that uh, the idea of changing and how people because that's something that I'm navigating right now because I had to kind of look at my situation and said, OK, I do a lot of stuff for artist support and I have a lot of artists that follow me, but the sales have kind of died. So maybe I need to look at who. I'm targeting, like, it's okay to do stuff so, to support artists, but if I cannot build the sustainability, I can't help myself. I can't help anybody else. So I've had to kind of change up what I'm doing a little bit to make sure that I'm targeting both buyers, people that will collect the work and make this sustainable as well as the artists. And sometimes when you do make those shifts with how you do social media with the algorithm, stuff like that, sometimes it drastically impacts your reach or your performance. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, it, it, it's really painful thinking that a year and a half ago, it hit 5,000 likes like it was nothing on Instagram. I'm like, if I hit 100 likes, that's a home run. Same for me. Same amount of followers. 10,000 <laughs> followers. And it's like it showed it to 90 of them. Uh, 
I, I, I realized I can't control the algorithm. I just got to work with what I got. Um, you know, there's, there's different aspects though. Um, it used to be, I'd post something and somebody would DM me and we would do it through, through DMS, like, you know, through the sale and, and things have changed. They, at least from what I've noticed, the buyers are less inclined to want to get a hold of me and they want the easiest one click satisfaction it's mine and i've spent the last few months redoing my website which i finally just got back up uh because i felt it was messy like you got to click here here and here yeah so i just just took it all apart now it's just what you see is available one click if you want and it's yours uh, so we'll see how that goes you know but i've also you gotta kind of i I respect all my followers and I thank them all so much all the time. I, I couldn't be where I am without them or without some of my mentors. Sometimes you got to use that leverage to get in the door to places though. Like, unfortunately, you know, Hey, I'm an artist. I'm just checking out this stuff. You, you know, if you ever need anything for your storefront or for this. Yeah. Oh, well, who are you? Well, this, this, here's my Instagram. <laughs> I am professional. Unfortunately, numbers mean professional. Which, yeah. you know, I, I get DMs all the time, probably much like you, uh, Michael, where people are asking me for advice. And I love answering it. A lot of times when I answer people, they will be surprised that I reply back. And I just say, you know, I, I message people with 100,000 followers and hope that somebody replies back if I have a question. Um, there's people with 200 followers that are killing me in sales. So it's not... It's not always about the number of the followers, but sometimes it is something that can be to your advantage in the and, out in the real world and not online. Shoot your shot. Yeah. Go ahead, Vinny. No, I just say shoot your shot. I mean, you you never know who's gonna respond back to you. I did the other day and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna direct message uh Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> but like the funny thing is like I did a tweet and like I tagged Tony Robbins in it with, it was a picture of him and I tagged him in it and like, he retweeted like five times, like commented on it. Like, and it's one of those things like you just tag the person. If you like their, their painting or whatever it is, you never know who's going to actually see it. And yeah. Yeah. You never know. There's always that, that one chance. You're both kind of spot on with that. And Justin, I, you and I seem to kind of be on the same trajectory because I did the same thing with my website probably about three months ago, I realized that I too used to get a lot of DMs. I get more on Facebook than I do on Instagram because I think Facebook's a little bit more of a buying market, or at least it has been for me. But I noticed I wasn't getting as many of those. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'm making it too hard for people to find me because people, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but people want to be lazy. People don't want to have to search for things. And even oh, if, you make it if I can click on money, it, <laughs> if I can click and it'll be at my house in two days, and move on, you know, so it's easy. Yeah. So uh, I went through it and for a long time, I didn't want to have my originals available on my site. I wanted people to have to contact me so we could have a dialogue. We could build a relationship. I don't think people want that as much anymore. Some people do. Not everybody does. But I realized that I was kind of hurting myself by not having my inventory visible even. Right. And how can I sell something if it's not visible? So if I'm going to sit here and, and whine and complain about, oh, People aren't buying my stuff. Well, it needs to be visible. If, if it's not visible, then it's partially my fault. So I did that, and I put all my originals up on my site. So finally got those up, and we'll kind of see how that goes. I'm kind of in that process now where I'm going to see if it actually works. Uh, but uh, with what you mentioned, Vinny, yeah, shooting your shot, because that's what I did this week. I reached out to over 100 companies, uh, beverage companies, breweries, uh, companies yeah. hotels, skateboard companies surfboard companies and i, I kind of created uh, and crafted one general email that kind of summed up what i was trying to do because i was reaching out to a lot of the same type of companies so one kind of worked and i could input the right information but it just said you know hey i'm michael carini i'm a full-time san diego based artist that does this this and this i have a focus on this and i have experience doing labels and as a brand partner brand ambassador and i'm looking for new companies to work with on artist collaborations and again, going to that 100 rule, I figured, you know, I'm going to have to shoot a lot of shots. So 
A lot of times it'll go to a dumpster. People won't even see the message. It'll go to customer service, especially for big companies. Oh, but yeah. You never know. It may land in the inbox that it needs to, and it can lead to one opportunity, and that one opportunity can snowball into another. But I figured, hey, if I can contact 100 companies in three days, then perhaps for a little while I haven't been working quite as hard or as smart as I thought I was. One thing I'll say, I used to work at a library and I learned a lot about finding the right information online. You know, with what's right, what's, what's not right, what's valid, what's invalid. Um, so when I want to approach a place, you know, you do the Google or you go to their website, you try to find contact, do all that. And if it just seems really generic, I go in Google and I just start inputting the words differently or I try to find out who it is I'm really trying to get a hold of at that company. And you would, I shouldn't even say, you can really find ways to get a hold of people. <laughs> it doesn't always pan out, trust me. But but just knowing that you can at least get to the right person is, is just another bump. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely... Uh, and, and like you said, the breweries. Uh, so I, I was wanting to do a label for a local brewery for a long time. And they just had a completely different style. You know, a lot of them are image-based. I'm abstract-based. And it just wasn't going to happen. And uh, set, up, set up a friend and I. We just set up our own art show, completely DIY. What do you have at art shows? You have drinks. You have whatever. Try to impress people. So I went back to that brewery and was like, hey, we're having an event. Would you like to sponsor it? You know, we're not wine guys. We're beer guys. You know, our things are wine, but let's, we want to do beer custom, you know? And they're like, no problem. We'll give you two kegs for free. You know, sometimes things work out differently like that. And <laughs> it, it brought people in. So, <laughs> Well, and you mentioned uh, the abstract art. And so, just uh, in the past couple of weeks, I got released by my agency. And uh, my hope when I signed a little over a year ago was that they were going to be able to bring in big deals. They were going to partner me with companies and just I was going to explode. I was going to be a household name. And it didn't happen. And uh, let me tell you, nothing will ever hurt you like your own expectations. But I have oh, reasons yeah. to believe that it was going to go in that direction. And so the reason that I was contacting all these companies this past week is because I'm on my own again. But I, I kind of am okay with it. It was kind of a relationship that wasn't working. And I was kind of feeling like, oh, you know, I don't know if this really works for me. But they made the decision. And so I was like, okay, okay, well, now I'm on my own again. Now I can go back to doing it my way, but I can aggressively approach it. I think that when I was signed by somebody else, I was like, well, I don't want to infringe or step on their toes. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. So it was kind of putting me in, in a little bit of limbo. But one of the reasons they believed they had difficulty with pushing me was because they deal with a lot of artists that do more representational based work or customize cater to holidays, things like that. So greeting cards, things like that, stuff that's very commercial in nature that you see in stores. And they said that they were having difficulty with the abstract art, but I don't understand. And the reason I don't understand is because abstract art, it's so universal. It can work with anything and it doesn't have to have a firm message. And then when you think about like the Muslim culture, the Muslim culture a lot of times can't have imagery. So you really open yourself up to so many possibilities with abstract art because it's like, hey, you can take my design, my abstract image, you can put it on any product in the world and you can put your typography and your message on top of it and it works. Whereas if you have an artist that, you know, does cat. Now I love cats, but if you have an artist that does like images of cats, it's like, well, it's going to be very specific what it works for, but I feel like abstract art should work for everything. So I don't get it, Justin. I don't understand. I don't, I don't either. I've never pursued the licensing deals. I have a friend and I started following her a while ago. You know, she lives across the country from me and uh, I had some bad health. Uh, about a year ago and I took six months off social media. I, I, you know, I had to focus on myself and I come back to social media and I'm like, Holy crap, she's doing amazing. And she does abstract art and it's 
It's very simplistic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, to pull off very simplistic abstract art is hard. But it was smaller style. And then she approached the licen licensing idea instead of a gallery because, you know, they're smaller pieces. And she ended up on a, you know, uh, I can't remember the company's name, but like, hey, we want to license you for our gift bags. Oh, okay, great. And then it exploded and she's in every Target and Whole Foods this year, you know? Um, and it's, it's, I will say this, and maybe maybe Vinny can, can give me some hints. I'm in the Midwest, maybe it's different. Uh, I try to approach realtors, uh, home stagers. Everything is beige. When is that phase gonna end? <laughs> When's color coming back? Vinny, you seen that? Well, the the thing you have to think about, right, is is neutral is safe, right? I mean, <laughs> well, I always make a joke about this. My my wife picks my clothes, right? She's like, oh come on, I actually have a uniform for the team, just makes it easier for me to to work every day, right? But for most most choices when you're basically getting a property prepped is going to be a base color. Now you do have, like, I think you said the stagers, those are going to be the people that are going to be open to, I think more of the colors, but the realtors for the most part are probably the best people to, to talk to about those things. Well, and well I just, it used to, it used to be, a, you know, you'd have your white trim or even now, you know, your white trim or your light gray wall or anything, but put a pop of color on it. Yeah, nobody that's... wants nobody wants to do that right now. It is like, but you're also. No. I, mean, I think you're wicker and neutral. <laughs> it, it, it's it's you open up to a wider wider demographic. I agree. I mean, in a, in a home that someone's actually going to live in, right? You're looking at basically an accent wall. But most people yeah. look at properties as more of a um, an empty canvas with basically yeah. an idea of where they can do with it. And if you do. The, do that one accent, it could turn off a couple of people if it's not done. I mean, I've had some weird requests. I had this one person once that was, and it, it might be a cop out. Sometimes this stuff is a cop out, but it was like, okay, I'm going to buy this house because there's a pomegranate tree in the backyard. I was like, we could, we could put, we could put a pomegranate tree in the backyard. Look at the actual house. So people sometimes purchase things for crazy reasons. And sometimes, they don't purchase it for other ones, just like in the Chinese culture, right? If it's a red door, it's a good sign. I don't know. Yeah, so yeah. I think, right, Vinny, because I think a safer route or a, a route that is more likely to lead to success. And Justin, with your friend, what I've noticed a little bit and what I kind of noticed with the agency too, and just from my experience in the industry, is that abstract art, when it is a little more minimalistic or simple yes. and it's not threatening, I think that it does better. And so I have a lot of difficulty with my work because my work is so different and I feel like my work is not safe and my work has a lot of pop and color to it. And so there are people that are like, oh my God, I love it and I feel it so intensely because of that. But there are a lot of people that are looking more for the neutrals. And even my galleries have told me like, hey, you know, we seem to do pretty well with neutral and earth tones blacks, whites, grays, stuff like that. Maybe some metallics, but limited, uh, maybe like a gold color palette, something like that, but not massive splashes. And I'm a dude that loves to work with magenta and, and pink and stuff like that. And, and I think that they're great colors to work with, but there are a lot of people that are just like, not the color for me, don't want it on my wall. And what's funny is on social media, if I use neon pink, magenta, I know that post is going to go through the roof compared to my other posts. People will love it online. But in person, you know, they want the darker or the muted colors. It's it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we just built our home a couple years ago. And I'm in my office and, you know, I got a bunch of white walls because I got to hang stuff and see what I think. But I have one wall that is, I think it's called like, space blue or something it is like extremely dark um but when we were looking there was one house we loved and its whole kitchen it was it was open floor plan the kitchen the dining area 
was all painted sea foam. And now this is a home that was maybe just two years old, very new. And they even had a stipulation that they would cover all paint costs if somebody wanted to change the sea foam. And, you know, we went home and we thought about it for a few days and we were like, let's go look at it again. This might be the one. And in that few days, we'd went back and they had painted it flat gray and it lost. Like We felt like we wanted that sea foam <laughs> so much that it totally turned us off. She said, paint it back. <laughs> it, well, yeah, you know, like paint it back, guys. But, um, you know, yes. at the time it was, we were teeter tottering whether to look, go with this house or move forward with building and so we were just kind of like you know what maybe let's let's just build it the way we want it and uh i, and yeah. I think i think it goes to the idea of uh, and, and this is gonna i'm trying to get there but being noticed right i mean like if you have a bold painting in your house that's gonna be something that's gonna i guess get you noticed Some people don't want to get noticed they want it to more kind of be as it is i don't know that's it becomes the focal point. Yeah, it becomes the focal point, and instead of basically the the house or the other stuff, right? Well, so when someone's living there, I wonder how many people actually want that huge that one painting that's going to be the focal point of the house when everyone comes in. Well, and that's why a lot of hospitals and restaurants and places like that, hotels, they go with stuff that is not threatening. It's stuff that kind of fits in. Like, yeah, you may notice it, but it's an accent. It's not something that generally really stands out yeah and uh anytime i think about scaling back i end up going the opposite direction so <laughs> it's just the way it works <laughs> guilty of that too anytime i say that i'm gonna go in the other direction to kind of scale back on something i end up going four times as hard with it <laughs> yeah so, yeah couldn't abstract be more of the the art of the relative future right i mean because if we're people have a shorter attention span, right? When it comes to things and abstract has a lot to look at, right? It might be an avenue that pulls people away to actually get out of their day to day and actually focus on something. I mean, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm thinking way too deep on that, but no, well, there's a lot of, a lot more home offices, people working from home and a lot less big businesses with offices to fill. So I, I think all of us as artists have felt that at least, um, but, um, I don't even remember where I was going with it, but it was, was it, uh, that, like John Michael, um, who had that famous saying, um, you know, when he was working with Warhol, and a, a, a rich family came through and we're looking, he had like 10 paintings displayed for them. And the, the lady kept going, I really like this one. It doesn't match the living room. It doesn't match the furniture. It doesn't match anything. Um, would you make something custom for us? And he's like, but you like this one? She's like, yeah, but it doesn't match. And he goes, well, then redecorate your fucking house. <laughs> 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 and I wish I was at a point in life where I could say that. <laughs> I have had people tell me that they redecorated their homes essentially to work around my art. And like, there's nothing more flattering than that. Because I'm a big believer that you should buy the art that you connect with, the art that you feel. You know, if you, like, if you're in tense about a certain painting but you decide to get another one because it just matches the stuff that you have i'm not going to say that it's wrong but you're always going to wonder and you're never going to have quite the, the depth of the relationship you would have with the piece that you feel intensely about and then with what you were saying i think that you were kind of on to something because abstract art is about pushing the boundaries of the mind now the difficulty with that though is that not everybody is willing or ready to push the boundaries of the mind. And so I think about abstract art as it's shown on social media. There are a lot of people that still troll it, say, oh, my kid could do that. Oh, there's no talent there. And those are people that have no basis of understanding. They don't understand what it's about. And, and I, at one point in my career, because I'm classically trained and learned all the fundamentals, there was a time where I felt that way. I was like, well, that's abstract. You could do that in 30 seconds. And I did this and it took this long and I qualified and quantified it and justified that my work was more valuable because of that. And it was all a load of bullshit. It was about my own insecurities and my lack of understanding. And so uh, I, I think though that with art being ruled out of curriculums, 
uh, I think it's going to be tough to, to get there because we're not getting in a way we are getting more art. We're bombarded with it by social media, but we're not getting the education, the understanding, unless people are taking the time to educate themselves or to, to learn about it through like the videos that I do and things like that. And so th there is still a lot of trolling, a lot of people that just hate on it because they're like, oh, well, there's no talent involved there. Uh, the only real art is representational art. And, and now we're also dealing with the conundrum that is AI art. And oh, yeah. Spitting out limitless imagery with a snap of a finger, whereas artists like me are now having more difficulty building a viable sustainability because now people are feeling like, and I don't want to say that somebody's not an artist, but the way that I look at AI art, it's like if you commission somebody to do a painting for you and they do that painting, can you claim that painting is yours? Like you may own the painting, but can you claim that you did that painting? It's like when right. I was in grade school and people in fourth grade would be like, oh, Michael, do my art project for me. And I would do their art project and they take it home and claim it as their own. All they did was ask me to do it for them. And so technically, yeah, they may. Yeah. What did they actually do? What was actually made? And this we're going to call the new art uh, telling something to make the art. If that's classified as a new art form, then, then okay, then that's art. But aside from that, what are people actually making or creating? Well, if, if, My, you're, if you're based, let me, let me, I'll go a different way. <clears throat> Would you say, um a Elon Musk made the I guess car I uh, made a uh, Tesla right the cars. No. you want to say that he, no that he made the cars no so so would you say anyone if basically if they're basically the superintendent of a job site and they built the the property right they they didn't make the, the house or are they basically only the people I that I get where I get where you're going with that. It's like if you're like the boss of something, like you know, or, or you work for a company, can you say that you did it versus somebody else did it? But but I feel like it's a little bit different when it comes to art. I mean, I I wonder how much description you have into it, right? Same thing with web design, right? I mean, I guess not web design, but if you did some sort of algorithm, right, to build build something, and then that puts out this product, so I guess it's on how much you actually put time into it. I was That'd be my interpretation, but I'll let you go for it, Justin. Uh, well, you know, I would look at it like, say, if you're building a house, which I, I think everything's art, like building a house, the design, all of that, that architecture, that's, that's you know, something they've learned as a, we've learned painting. Um, you know, think of the project managers, maybe your gallerist. Um, or something along those lines. Or somebody that's commissioned you. Um, or you're acting on behalf of a commission. Um, well, the person who designs it is definitely part of the building scheme. I agree. But, but the person who's checking in on the guys that are building it, they're more, they know what they're looking for. As in, so maybe they're like, a, like, you know, who do you want to recruit or say, Say you owned a business and you had this massive office complex and then you go to a gallery and you say, I'm looking for art to fill the walls. It needs to be cohesive, preferably something that anybody can look at without it being super representative of one thing or kind. So then the gallery goes to the artist <laughs> or three or four artists. Um, I don't know if that's a good description, but you know, people have their placements in different spots. Um, so there, there is this one AI artist that I do follow on threads. Uh, he does cars. He pumps out cars all day, every day. I love cars. So I follow it, but will his followers ever probably buy a painting of mine? No. Um, can I enjoy what he has had produced? Yes, um, but when I get those people that that are like, "Are you scared of AI?" I'm like, "Not, not in the I'm gonna lose sales." Um, 
but in the if you're looking for a painting i suggest and you're confused as to what ai versus an actual hand done painting is go to a, a museum look very closely at the brush strokes the colors that you cannot replicate you know i don't i don't have this like grand thought of like i'm this artist and i'm this amazing like nobody's gonna be me i don't i don't have that but i have lots of respect so, for what i create and for what others create so you do you think there'll be a point in time where ai will be considered a a tool like a brushes and the artist will be basically the person that uh describes what the 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 tool should put together I don't think it'll go that far, or at least I hope it, you know, it doesn't reach that point. I still want there to always be hands-on like woodworkers, you know, you want them to be hands-on. Um, I think, you know, to me, it re reminds me a lot of NFT. Oh man, these, these, these guys who are just digital creators all of a sudden are famous artists and two years later, nothing. I mean, it did help propel their career, but a lot of those guys, a lot of those guys that are doing huge now that did that, they're really good artists in real life as well. Um, you know, I don't want to knock the NFT community. <laughs> I mean, I thought about it. I didn't really go into it, but I, I see that as there was so much fear from, from artists like, oh my gosh, NFTs are going to kill us. And it didn't. They're... There's NFTs still. It's not as big as it was. There's still artists. Now there's AI, which is the next big fear. Let's see where we're at in two years. <laughs> you well, know, I think, I think it draws a different crowd. I think what really killed the NFTs was those scams and spammers on Facebook <laughs> and Instagram. Because now anytime somebody hears the word NFT, they vomit. Because of the fact that artists get scammed and messaged uh, me, I get probably at least a dozen of those messages a day about, hey, like I'm interested in buying your art. And sometimes it sounds very convincing in the first message. And you follow up, you invest a few minutes of your time, and then bam, it's like you have this just emotional dump. And so there's just this negative, horrible feeling attached to NFT because as soon as you see the word NFT, you just know that you're being scammed. But in terms of the AI, I'm not going to say one way or another, but uh, I have noticed, and it could just be because of what Facebook and Instagram show me a lot. But I notice when people post AI art, sometimes it gets a very large response. It gets a lot of engagement, sometimes very positive engagement. And so as an artist that takes time and loves the process and puts in the time, the energy and that is not a hobby. There's nothing wrong with doing art as a hobby. But when you make your living doing this and you depend on it and you put your time energy into it and you share your work and you just notice that the AI stuff that people are just cranking out or throwing out or just threw out a few words and boom, spits out a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing image, gets all this engagement and your work gets none. I have to be a little at least apprehensive about that, if not fearful, because... What is to prevent somebody from taking these beautiful AI images and turning them into canvas prints? And oh, yeah, easy. Canvas print? Very yeah. easy. So a big part of sustainability as an artist and what I'm shifting back to is realizing that it depends on the merchandise market because not everybody has the budget for originals. So you have to work the merchandise and the smaller level things that can help build that sustainability, especially trying to live here in San Diego. So... What I'm really trying to focus on right now is more on the print market because it's a budget that is more supportive of people that are struggling, of people that may connect with my work. But now if I'm competing with AI and just limitless possibilities being thrown out there on a whim or on a click, that's a little intimidating and it may make me have to reevaluate how I approach So I won't give up. I will not lose hope but I do see the obstacles potentially ahead of me. And I think that they are yeah. very real. And I think that I do have to acknowledge them. Well, you're going to yeah. have to, I mean, probably focus on more either on the premium market 
or focus more so on the story that you're telling, right? I mean, if you're simply fighting based off of, I guess, price, that affordable market, right? The prints. I mean, it, it seems like it's going to be harder to compete at that market. Well, That's yeah, and there have been print-on-demand shops and whatnot that sell. So, and and so I'll just be completely candid here because I throw everything out. So That's I fine. <laughs> by a company called iCanvas. So if people go to iCanvas, they have canvas prints in my work. So I canvas prints in my work that I sell on my shop using a print-on-demand service. I control the margins. I choose what I sell them for. I make a lot of money on those when I sell them. Good profit margins. I also have that licensing deal with iCanvas. And I love working with iCanvas because I feel that it's not competition because it reaches people that would not have found my art. It's a different market. It opens me up to distribution channels like Bed Bath & Beyond, like Wayfair, stuff like that. So people can find my work through there. And it's because of iCanvas. But iCanvas, because of their production methods, they're able to sell my canvas prints for like 30, 40 bucks. Even with my print on demand and cost being very reasonable, I can't sell stuff for 30, 40 bucks. No. Um, you know, with that, I think I've never really dived into prints. Uh, I have been putting some stuff on paper that I'm thinking of like how I want to go about it. I do offer, you know, if you've seen, if, if you follow me, you know, I, I'm often known as uh, the Pantone guy. I paint on Pantones and they're smaller pieces. And, you know, my prices have had to go up over the years, but, but offering a smaller piece for a hundred dollars, I, I think of people that have what I call, or what they call it, the gallery wall in their house where they can't afford a, a $4,000 painting, but they can afford a $100 painting. And, you know, so I can offer, you know, something that is five by seven at a price that they could hopefully, you know, afford. I like to be able to reach any anybody that, you know, wants art. Um, you know, you work with a gallery, your price kind of needs to go up a little bit. Uh, cost of paint has been through the roof. So that causes it to go up a little bit. Um, but what I've been thinking about with prints is what can I offer that would be maybe one step more? And maybe this would be something interesting. You know, I'd love to talk to you more about it, Michael. Um, you know, I want to get a high, a very well done, high res, high quality print. Um, and then I want to embellish each print slightly differently. Uh, either some gold leaf or adding some accents and hand signing them. And now I know that's a lot more work because then I got to wrap them and ship them. And I'll tell you what I hate more than anything. It is shipping stuff. <laughs> I always want to, I get worried that it's not going to arrive or it'll get damaged. Um, but something about making the print also a one of one, you know, if I might do 15 of the same painting but I will embellish each one slightly differently. And then, you know, the price might be a little higher on that. So we're gonna do something a little different that I don't normally do here, but like, I'm just gonna give you like, in real time kind of, uh, I don't wanna say advice, but I, I wanna pick your brain for a second. So uh, who are you using for paint? What's your preferred paint brand, if you don't mind saying? Golden. Golden. So I think that you should check out Nova Color. So Nova Color, I compare them most with Golden in terms of the quality, in terms of the thickness. There is not quite the breadth and repertoire of colors, but Nova Color is factory direct. So they're wholesale prices. So they're very cost effective, especially if you get uh, go from the four ounce to the eight ounce to the 16 to the 32, gets much more cost effective. Uh, I would encourage you to try them if you haven't. So like, you just get a couple colors, but they actually sell a bundle that I curated on their website. Okay. I don't make any money off of it. It's just I've used them for years and I love working with them. So you should get a kickback. <laughs> well, they asked me if I wanted to do the affiliate program, and I just don't right. really like doing affiliate programs because I feel like anytime I throw out an affiliate link, it just deters people. And I just yeah. want people to do it because I like them. But uh, I mean, yeah, I do need to find ways to start monetizing some of these relationships in some way because it's like, I, you know, I, I do get picky. I like um, if I'm doing some crazy texture, I like full body. I've lately been using a lot of soft body, but uh, like golden so flat paints. 
So it's it's matte, but for some reason the color is just intense. Um, and lately I've been doing that because I've been working with stucco. Okay. So as opposed to using thick paint, I will make how I want my structure to be with stucco on wood. And then once that's dry, usually overnight, I will paint over it. And uh, I'm really enjoying that process because I almost never used a brush. And now I'm using brushes again. You know, there's a constant change. And um, one thing I've really experimented with, and I don't, I, I wasn't quite sure with the reaction I got from people. Uh, so on one of them, I did stucco. And I bought a jar of sprinkles and I pushed them into the painting and then I used the pearl clear coat over it. And so people kept keep going, but, but what is, it? is it real? I'm like, no, it is. You go to the store and you buy the candy sprinkles. <laughs> it's not like, you know, plastic or gel or it's, it's the real thing. And, um, you know, like here's one of them. It gives a sense of texture, but I did this one weeks ago and it still smells like sugar. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really into experimenting with that, you know, like, so AI can do these amazing women and backgrounds and everything else. Well, mine smells like candy. <laughs> there you go. Well, AI I, I wanted to. Hand, so. Yeah. And, you know, what's, what I think is odd in the art world is companies and so many of the other, like, self-employed businesses offer endorsements. The art world, you know, I've, I've gotten kicked a free canvas. I've gotten some free colors. But in general, companies don't represent or, or say, hey, we want to be your paint company slash our logo and you got paint you know like that that doesn't happen in the art world and i i think that people don't realize that there are a few i know a few artists that have amazing deals but they are extremely high-end artists um so when we're spending the money on the high quality paints that's another figure in what you're getting is you're getting you know the guarantee the paint's not gonna fade yeah it's not gonna crack or rot right away you know like I take a lot of pride in that, but you know, it's not like I'm calling up place. Hey, Dick Blick, ship me a hundred canvases. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And well, I would it, love to see more well, of that. Also, I think that the thing is, is people don't know that it happens or uh, you're, you're right. In a sense, it doesn't happen, but it doesn't mean that you can't ask. So, Oh I yeah, I ask. And I, I have been lucky enough that people have, have given, you know, some companies have given me some products. They're like, hey, we're testing this out. Try it out. Tell us what you think. But as far as like an ongoing um, partnership, I don't see that I know of as much. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've gotten like free paints. I've gotten free supplies from a number of companies, but not really on a consistent permanent type of basis, like sponsorship type thing. Yeah. But I do throw out that word sponsorship a lot these days because you have – you know, influencers and people, brand partners, people that work with companies. And uh, I am looking for that. And so I do throw that out there knowing that, yes, you're right. Not a lot of companies do that, but it doesn't mean that they wouldn't entertain it. So maybe the best time to get your foot in the door for that is before it has really happened and taken off. Yeah, so that's, I'm working that's on true. That time. So that's actually part of my proposal when I do reach out to companies and something that I explore. But uh, you mentioned something earlier, too, that I wanted to ask about. So what is your general price point? Like, what's the range? Um, you know, I can negotiate on anything. Uh, generally saying uh, I, I start at $100 and I don't have a cap, you know. Heaven forbid somebody calls me and says, can you paint my house i'm not going to have a set price for that you know <laughs> but the um, work that you actively move the most would you say it's between like one in five one in a thousand one in 25 i'd say between let's say around two to three hundred okay so do you move based off of volume like you move a lot of work 
you know, for a, a while I did, and it has slowed down so much. And I have talked to other artists about it and they said, well, we're lowering our prices. And I said, I'm, I'm not lowering my prices. I have a gallery, first of all, that would not be happy if I was lowering my prices. Um, I think it's just like, we're waiting out, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was the slowest holiday season I'd ever had and everything it, but it wasn't just me. It was, it was everybody I talked to in the art world. So I feel like, you know, things are just kind of, you know, people are going out in the world again. Um, you know, it's an election year. People are, you know, being a bit conservative with their money. I, I really am thinking by this summer, I think things will start turning around in the art world. And I will say this, 75% of my art goes overseas. Europe oh, wow. is like my biggest customer. It's so funny that you say that because right as we were logging on, I had somebody message me from Denmark that was interested in something. And then I had an order come through from the Netherlands for one of my shirts. And I was thinking, I get so much more love from other countries than I do from my own. And then in terms of the United States, I get so much more love from like the Midwest and the East Coast than I do from my state. <laughs> oh, you know what's funny is for, for the states, I get a lot of West Coast, some East Coast. I don't get a lot of Midwest and I'm in the Midwest. You know, um, but, you know, I've shipped to Brazil. I've shipped to England. England is the biggest, the hardest as far as shipping details. You know, as in like, since they're purchasing a product from another country, that person has to go to the post office, pay a tax to get their thing. And I don't know what that is. So that I just like, that's on you, whatever that is. Um, you know, I shipped it. A gift because I've done that before too, because like, I know that the, the duties now to Canada is 40%. So like if I sell like a pair yeah, of a for $1,000, they would get hit with a $400 duties fee from customs. So a lot of times I'll tell them like, hey, if you want, I will declare it as a gift. If anything happens or it gets damaged, I will do a new piece, but it's a calculated risk. But like I would never expect somebody to pay $1,000 for painting and then pay $400 in taxes because it's absurd. The, the one thing I will say is I did that for a while. And I happened to just uh, meet a friend of a friend who works in the government. And that is like a federal issue if you got caught. <laughs> like marketing is it marking it as a gift if you got cash, you know. Um, while I totally agree with you, you know, I've shipped to Canada. It's definitely slowed down. Honestly, Europe is, is where I've sold the most. Um, you know, it's very interesting learning all these countries details like Brazil, it got to the person, but it took two months. Uh, you know, England, it's always, I message them and like, Hey, it's in the mail. Once it leaves our country, I have no control over anything. And it's that way with any country really. But, you know, I just kind of give them a heads up, like it's in the mail. So, you know, be sure to check with your post office, you know, when it's available. Um, but, you know, I, I think with, like, Europe, there's a lot less, you know, big box stores. Um, they can't just walk into, uh, at least here in the Midwest, you know, we got Walmarts and stuff that are four city blocks long. <laughs> um, it's just set up differently. You know, I have an amazing friend who lives in San Francisco, and it's like night and day. He's like, you know, there's just little shops. There's many targets. There's mini this version and like here we have these you know costcos that have indoor parking you know it's it's um i just think in europe they don't have as much of that and so maybe when they find things online it's not as it, it, there's something a little bit more special about getting it i don't i don't really know um because i market to everybody um and even on my website i I offer free shipping in the U S uh, I can't offer that worldwide cause I just don't know what it'll be. Um, but so I always say, just message me, I'll ship anywhere. But that was one thing I ran into with a lot of artists when I was starting out, they didn't, they, they only did shipping in the U S cause they didn't know how to take on shipping. And I'm like, once you get used to the forms, it's, 
it opens up a ginormous market. Well, and uh, also professional uh, people that can uh, create and ship for you. So I actually big orders. And then when it's something smaller, like if it's in the range of the five by sevens that you do, I would just use USPS and use one of the, if it was US based, I would use a flat rate box. Cause it yeah. you know, cost is going to be, I know how to pad it. I know how to make it work. And it's just super simple, super clean. Same thing every time. Yeah. You know, you just, you kind of get used to it. Um, it's just another aspect of the business people don't know. <laughs> Um, and you know, I don't, I don't hate on people who go to big box stores. I don't hate on any of these countries where it's more difficult. It's just, it's just the beast of getting what I need to get where it goes. Or, uh, you know, the people who, you know, if you're, you know, a college kid and you're looking to decorate your dorm, you can't, you're not just going to go out and buy art. You're either going to make art or you're going to, you're going to get something extremely affordable just for the time being, you know? Um, so, you know, everybody can do their own thing. Um, but it's just, I find it so interesting because to think, you know, so worldly, you know, I constantly in MDMs with people from other countries and finding out what it's like there. They're just people, but it's very different. Um, people's thoughts, you know, because we all think about where we're at, not where everybody else is. So hearing what's going on in everybody's world is interesting. Now, Vinny, when people buy homes from you, they probably don't share this, but like, I'm curious if you kind of have your finger on the pulse of this. Like, when they move into their homes, have they kind of, in many cases, like blown the budget? Like, probably, I mean, people need to decorate when they move in. Do you think that they're thinking about these things? They're like, oh, what are we going to put on the walls? We need to get some art. Are they thinking about like furniture? <laughs> vendor, you know? No, they're not. I mean, Majority of people, no. I mean, they're looking at, yeah, furniture, how they're going to lay the house out. I mean, I, I know, and we've had this talk many of times, how you stated um, uh, artwork is a necessity. I, I think there's a roof of your head and food and things like that are more of a necessity, and furniture is probably going to get to the next step, but not necessarily necessity. But, yeah, I mean, unless you have, if, I mean, most people, yeah, thinking of other stuff, and then as they get in there, they start adding to it or seeing what's 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 affordable and things like that. I mean, so I would guess the bigger pieces that you guys have. I mean, those are individuals that are buying those are not worrying about um, the furniture. They're like, let's get the artwork. But the ones that are buying the the five by sevens and the smaller stuff, they're the ones that are probably worried about, yeah, other stuff. And then yeah, and here in California in particular, in Southern California, the housing market is just wild in terms of costs of things. And I, I remember seeing the other day of like essentially how long, well, not how long, but uh, like how much people have to make in order to be able to pay off a home. So I, I think that that's playing a big factor into the market, at least out here on the West coast in terms of people getting, whereas before people would move into homes, maybe they were more affordable and people would maybe think like, okay, well now we got to decorate. Now we got to get some art. And now, you know, there may not be anything left over for that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been in the business for 13 years. Uh, I've really, for the most part, haven't. Majority of my clientele are, are not like, where am I going to put that art piece? Or am I going to get the art piece there? They've always been like, where we put the furniture, where we put the couch, where we put the TV. Right? If they're thinking that kind of stuff. So even though the price has changed, it's been a secondary thing. I mean, for my clients that are like multi million, that have bought properties in the like the multi millions, right? Yeah, they're they're thinking about the artwork. Let's get my uh, interior designer to come through here and let's get an idea of it. But the other ones are not really thinking that, in my opinion. Yeah, they're they're, they're the ones that are thinking though of their art collection as when they retire they're gonna sell it probably, you know. Or, uh, you know, like the average person might just buy art to decorate that they like with and they're not thinking it of as like an investment. You know, I, I try not to think of it as an investment when I buy it. I buy what I like. But as an artist, I'm not able to buy as much as I want. <laughs> um, but I mean, I can see that, you know, definitely as a person who's recently bought a home, it was like, we need food <laughs> and we 
we need new furniture because the old furniture was falling apart. <laughs> but at some point, you know, you want something, color or something. Well, at least I do. <laughs> I mean, I would think it, I mean, like you said, or I don't know who said it, one of you said it, about basically, okay, you get the artwork, but the art, oh yeah, that was the Warhol, right? That, oh my, your um, painting doesn't match my, my, my stuff, right? So I would think it's mostly probably in that middle ground, right? Of like, they've owned the property for eight years, 10 years. They want to get new furniture and they want to fully redecorate their place. That's when they're going to get the, that nice piece, the average person. Well, you say average, the, the person that's going to do that the per, is going to be a person that has the resources to be able to redecorate, which in this stage means having to have a little bit more money. So, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, as I, you had this increasing disparity between the rich and the poor, uh, that's where it's getting a little difficult. And, you know, and so there is always somebody out there buying art, but you got to find a way to tap that market. And I think that's a creative challenge posed to us. I I think it's less of the rich and poor and more of we like art. So we assume people like art. Not everybody gives a care about art, you know, so it'll never be on their radar. So, yeah, I guess I've been deceiving myself and telling myself that everybody loves me. <laughs> <laughs> but it does seem, uh, you want to tell us where people can find you in terms of your gallery, your socials, what you're doing, what you got coming up? Um, you know, I'm, I'm in, uh, the Gilded Pear Gallery. It's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and they're wonderful to work with. They're great. Um, you know, I'm always on Instagram. I, I, I'm on threads. That's where I met, uh, you know, Michael. Um, I thought threads was great when it started, by the way, you know, just, I met so many artists I didn't see on Instagram. Uh, so I've got a whole new group of friends. <laughs> I'm on there, um, but I can't see your threads out. No, I, I, I just try to stick to like this little narrow area. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm very active on Instagram. Um, I'm debating whether to try to, you know, dive into YouTube. I was going to ask you, how is your uh, monthly online service going? You know, <laughs> on YouTube. No, like on the, the OnlyFans. Um, so I think that people were expecting me to do hardcore porn. And so I had <laughs> people, I did have like a lot of people sign up at first, but I think that they were expecting hardcore porn. And so my page, like John Cena recently started a page and it was for his movie where it's kind of like parody. So I would say that mine is kind of like that. Like there is informative stuff. I do give people like my new releases, but I call it my new drops. And it's like me standing naked, but covering myself with the painting. So there's nothing hardcore about it. But like, I'll do a lot of captions that are kind of like leading you to believe that it is more provocative than it is because I just want to be me. But like, I'm not, I wasn't going to go into the realm of doing like super spicy stuff because that's not me. But I am somebody that kind of, you know, just has fun. But so yeah, I'm not making the most money on there, but I do love it in the fact that it's a platform that allows me to just be myself. Do what you want. What I want to do. And I don't have to. Yeah, worry. I was wondering about that. I was like, do you paint in the nude and then people watch? Or is it just like you're making videos of you presenting art or you making art and it's just kind of like alluding to things? It's a lot more behind the scenes content. So it'll be like, I'll just turn on the camera and you can see me actually making stuff. I do have some tutorials on there. I do post a lot of my photo shoots on there. Some like will have my butt. Like I do pro put a lot of like my workout and fitness stuff on there. so there is like some sweat and stuff like that on there for people that do want like a little bit of the show but it's not pornographic it's not adult in nature like i would say that i'm no more than the pg-13 rating but sometimes i just have fun with the captions that's that's cool you know it's uh what's that app that that everybody uses and i feel like um it's really hard to get people on um or there's monthly services. Um, I'm forgetting now, but uh, Patreon. Patreon, Patreon. But like, there, there's something unique by you saying I'm on OnlyFans. It people like stop for a second. And they're like, well, well, let yeah, me think about this you, for a minute. You know, on so link tree, on my link tree, if you uh, go to it, it shows the analytics. And if you look at my Instagram on my link tree, it shows like 64 clicks. And then you go to my OnlyFans link. 
there's like a thousand clicks on it. So people are clicking, you know, people may not be signing up, but people are checking it out. You know, they're, they're like, I'm not into that. Click, click, click. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's so clear because it has more clicks than all of my other links combines. But people are not necessarily wanting to subscribe. But like if people do subscribe and they don't like it, then they just don't resubscribe. But guess what? I just made, you know, 10 bucks or something like that. And for me, you know, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. Sometimes 10 bucks means food. So I'm not making yeah. the most money on there. I'm not the most successful on there. I'm not as successful as a lot of the girls that I work with that are on there. But I'm doing my thing. It's a little bit of money. It's passive income. And as I figure it out, maybe I can grow because I actually did reach out to OnlyFans headquarters about partnering with them more. So my OnlyFans page is art.daddy. So that's why I wear a lot of the merch and stuff and play off of that. So the merch you know, is great, by the way. You know, like I always try to think of how to brand a shirt as an artist, like somebody wants to wear, you know. But but then so then YouTube, do you I I, I haven't checked out, unfortunately, like you know, YouTube is something I'm not always on, but but recently I have been starting to dive into and are you, you know, I've heard monetizing on YouTube is so much better than anywhere else. And I was just wondering if that was true. I'm nowhere near the ability to monetize because you have to have people watch so many hours of your content. And you know, I like a, like a, like a thousand viewers and a million views or something. something yeah, something like, like that. that. But it's over a period of time. And like, I'm not, e I don't even get within 10% of that. Wow. So I think the monetization may have been more friendly in the past. So, you know, I just throw out the content on YouTube, like this feed that we're doing right now, it gets live streamed to YouTube. I do a lot of two minute artist support talks on YouTube now. I've started doing the shorter ones, hoping I could just grab people and they'd watch them. Cause again, short attention. Those shorts, that's where all content. the views. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not the best performer on YouTube, but I figure, you know what, if I ever have something that blows up on there, I've got a thousand other videos for people to check out. So I'm planting the seeds and doing the work today for the opportunities that may come tomorrow. Definitely. You know, I, I've been a diehard Instagram since I started. And now I'm kind of like, you know, we're all doing our mail lists. I've been very bad about it lately. I'm trying to simplify my life. And all I seem to be doing is making it more complicated. But I realize, you know, if, if the algorithm actually tanks a lot more on us, you know, I... I used to do so well on Instagram, you know, um, and now I'm like, I need a, you know, I need a backup, you know, build an audience, you know, maybe reach a new audience, you know, always trying to find a new audience. It's, uh, it's not, I don't like to think of it as always trying to find sales, but always trying to find a like-minded person or something, you know? Uh, you know, the one thing people ask me about having so many followers is I said, I have so many friends. I talk to so many, you know, the, the people that buy from me, they don't hit the like button. They don't hit the share button. They don't ever comment. They just get in my DMS one day and buy. And that's cool. I'm fine with that. But then I have the artists that reach out, you know, I was a struggling artist on there and I met, um, if you've heard of Sergio Gomez, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I saw he was doing so well and I was DMing him all the time and he's like, Hey, no pressure. I have an artist group. And I was like, I'm not that kind of person. I don't buy into things. Uh, but I did. And I learned so much, not about making art, but about the art business and how to run social media. And, you know, what I thought I was doing was right. Wasn't, wasn't right. Um, you know, you really got to, put yourself out there. You know, it's not about the thing I tell other artists all the time is it's not about them finding you on social media. It's about you interacting with others. And that's controlling the algorithm a little bit, going to your artist friends page, leaving them a supportive comment. is awesome for them. And then, you know, maybe somebody will see it and check you out. It's, it's, it literally is social media. You know, the more you interact with others, in an honest way, the more likely you're going to be seen. Um, that's usually my best advice for people. I'm like, um, but it's changed so much. It's not about growth anymore. It's about 
like the connections. Yeah, very you much know, so. I mean, I have lots of lots of collectors that are artists. Um, so uh, while I'm also in that that mindset of I've got all my artist friends and some of them are collectors, I do need to branch out to a new way. And I don't know how to do that with hashtags right now. Um, all my art or all my reels are very artist based and supportive for other artists. Um, so I'm not really pushing out the the sales aspect much. Well, I feel you on that. Well, Justin, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage everybody to check out his work. And Justin, in the future, I want to get you on Instagram and you and I will do a live feed together so we can take kind of a continuation of this conversation and cover some of the things that we didn't have a chance to get to. But everyone check out Justin's work and uh, Vinny, any final thoughts for us? No, I guess, I guess people that are watching this right now, uh, what's your thought on, on abstract and, uh, what's your, what's your predictions? I always, I always love people's predictions of, uh, something's going to happen with technology when they have, uh, no background in it. So uh, hopefully you guys appreciated my, my insight into technology when it comes to artwork. So I'm curious to the people listening. No, I mean, I definitely do because, you know, I always think, of things from the inside, but I can only see things from my perspective. So when you said that, you know, it gets me to think of it in a new way. So I want to hear more from people too. You know, we want to hear your thoughts. We want to bring everybody into the conversation. So if, whether you have experience, you have no experience, whether you completely disagree with us and think that I'm an idiot, uh, you know, share your thoughts, but try to be like, don't pick on me too much because I'm already having a rough time. Wait, and also too, I just want the last thing. If you do think that a child could draw abstract art, how old would the child have to be? Please comment below. <laughs> so, okay. As we're leaving, this is the last thing I got to share. So I did, a, I dropped a reel the other day and I do my own audios. And I said, I when, saw it. <laughs> when people tell me that their kid could do what I do, I like to tell them that art styles are hereditary and ask them to give the child my best. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your old daddy? Yeah. Please subscribe, please share, and uh, join us uh, live for the next one. Bye, everyone.